Hello, this is Mrs. Connor, and today we are going to read A History of the U.S., Volume A, Prehistory to 1800, and we are going to read Chapter 71. This is on page 336. <clears throat> I will be reading the captions for all of the pictures. However, I'm not going to read the extra information that's on each page. So if you're interested in reading that, please feel free to take advantage of that great information that is provided for you. When it's over, shout hooray. In the War of Independence, the British had more fighting men, more guns, and more experience. But the Americans had a big advantage. They believed in their cause. In England, the war was not popular, and the longer it lasted, the more unpopular it became. It went on and on and on for more than eight years. Besides, the military leaders in England were trying to plan a war that was being fought thousands of miles away. That never works well. After the American victory at Saratoga, the war in the North became stalemated. That means it was even. That was good for the Patriots. Holding on was a kind of victory for the Americans. The British had to beat the rebel forces in order to win. So the English generals tried a new strategy. They shifted the war south. By 1778, three years into the war, Sir William Howe had gotten tired of the war and of being criticized for the way he was running things. So he resigned. General Henry Clinton became the new commander-in-chief of the British forces. Clinton believed the South was full of loyalists and that they would help the English soldiers. He named Lord Charles Cornwallis commander of the troops in the southern states. Then he loaded soldiers onto ships in New York's harbor and sent them south. Clinton kept a force in New York to hold on to that important city. So let's go back to 336. This picture is the British lay siege to Charleston, South Carolina. So they have set up for war and there's, those are their barricades and there is a picture of the soldiers in the battle. Page 337, we're on the second paragraph. Cornwallis was an able leader. First, the British captured Savannah, Georgia. A British colonel wrote of ripping one star and one stripe from the rebel flag of America. He was talking about Georgia. It seemed to be in British hands. Next, Cornwallis took Charleston, South Carolina. An American who was there described the British attack. It appeared as if the stars were tumbling down. Cannonballs whizzed and shells hissed continually amongst us. Ammunition chests blowing up, great guns bursting, and wounded men groaning. The British won again at Camden, South Carolina. That was a big win. England thought it had won the South, but those who believed in the Patriot cause wouldn't let them have it. Americans formed guerrilla bands and, taught, and, and fought as the Indians did with raiding parties. We fight, get beat, rise, and fight again, said Nathaniel Green, the same man who was quartermaster general at Valley Forge. It must have been frustrating for the English officers. They kept winning the big battles, but they seemed to be losing the war. Then came the most important battle of all, the Battle of Yorktown. Yorktown is a river port near the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. Let's take a look at that on the map. Here's the Chesapeake Bay. It's between Maryland and, De um, well, it goes in through Maryland. Um, Delaware is here and Virginia is here. Um, the James River flows into the Chesapeake Bay and it all flows into the Atlantic Ocean. And here is Yorktown. That's where General Cornwallis brought his troops in August 1781. It seemed an ideal headquarters spot for an army that got its supplies and support from the sea. Cornwallis's boss, General Clinton, was at the British military headquarters in New York. Clinton promised to send men and supplies by sea. The British were sure they would soon control Virginia. And here's a picture of George Washington at the Battle of Yorktown. You can see all of the smoke from things that were being destroyed. Page 338. Washington and a French general, the Comte de Rochambeau, were in Rhode Island making plans. At first they thought they would march their armies to New York, although they knew the city would be hard to take. Then they got word that a French admiral, Admiral, admiral de Grasse, was sailing from Haiti in the West Indies to Chesapeake Bay with a fleet of 28 ships. Could he blockade the bay and keep supplies from Cornwallis? That was what they hoped would happen. Rochambeau and Washington decided it was the chance they had been waiting for. 
They knew they would have to march their troops south, almost 500 miles. They had only a few weeks to do it. The French fleet couldn't stay for long. They marched south together, and it must have been some sight. The French officers were elegant in white uniforms with gold braid. Their horses pulled wagons holding chests full of coins. Most of the American officers wore bright blue uniforms with cream-colored trim called buff. By this time, many American privates, the ordinary soldiers, had uniforms too, although they were often torn and ragged. But it didn't matter. The soldiers marched proudly with their general. They had become a disciplined army. At Yorktown, three great military leaders greeted them. The dashing Frenchman, the Marquis de Lafayette, the cheerful German, Baron von Steuben, and a bold American, General Anthony Wayne, who was called Mad Anthony because he was so daring. They had great news for General Washington. And here is the map of the Revolutionary War and uh, where the battles took place. And this is a good map for you to take a look at. We will also be labeling it in our lesson. Page 340. The French Admiral, the Comte de, de, Comte de Grasse, had arrived at Chesapeake Bay, fought the English fleet, and set it sailing back to New York. And that wasn't all. De Grasse had brought extra troops who could fight on land. When George Washington heard all the news, he took off his hat and handkerchief and waved them about. That was unusual behavior for the dignified general. I have never seen a man moved by a greater or more sincere joy than was General Washington, wrote a French duke. When a French general stepped ashore, Washington gave the startled officer a big hug. The French-American army moved into Yorktown. They dug deep trenches at night. In the morning, the British redcoats found themselves trapped. A half circle of entrenched soldiers faced them. The York River was behind them. The Americans began firing their cannons. Then a brave young colonel named Alexander Hamilton led an attack. He captured a key British earth fortress. Here's a picture of a map of the Battle of Yorktown. You can see where everything was set up as, uh, as well as the ships and how they were placed within the sea. Well, the York River actually, which flows into the sea. The American army under George Washington fighting with a French army and French fleet defeated the British at the Battle of Yorktown. The British didn't have a chance. They were outnumbered and outflanked. Cornwallis did everything he could. He even tried to save his army by sailing his soldiers across the York River to safety. But he had bad luck. A sudden storm swamped the boats. The British adventure in America was coming to an end at Yorktown just 25 miles from Jamestown, where it had all begun. An English drummer boy climbed on top of a trench and beat his drums. An officer followed, waved, waving a white handkerchief. The great British army was surrendering. It was October 17th, 1781. Two days later, American soldiers stood proudly in a long line facing, facing them was a line of happy French soldiers. Between them marched the British and German armies. The defeated men were wearing clean uniforms and trying to keep their heads high. But many British soldiers cried when they laid down their arms. Army bands played an old English nursery tune. The world turned upside down. Here are the words and music. If buttercups buzzed after the bee, if boats were on land, churches on sea, if ponies rode men and grass ate the cows, and cats should be chased to holes by the mouse, if the mama sold their babies to the gypsy for half a crown, summer were spring and the other way around, then all the world would be upside down. And upside down it was. David had licked Goliath. The colonies would soon be states. The infant new world was growing. A superpower had been defeated by an upstart colony. Here's a picture of American General Benjamin Lincoln, center, in the center, right here prepares to accept the British surrender at Yorktown. George Washington is pictured on the right on a brown horse. Right here. Page 343. A new nation was being formed, a nation that would try not to, be, not to make the mistakes of its European parents, a nation that would be founded on ideas of freedom and equality, a nation ruled by laws, not kings. That nation soon had a great seal, which you see on every dollar bill. On one side are two Latin words, annuit coeptus, God has favored our venture. On the other side are the Latin words novus ordo seclorium. They mean a new order of the ages is created. Here's the great seal of the United States. It's on every dollar bill. And here on this map, the Treaty of Paris in 1783 gave the new United States all of the land 
formerly claimed by the British south of the Great Lakes and east of the Mississippi. So um, the expansion was great. You can see that we went from just having the 13 colonies to having all of this land right here.